right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Rail Bricker, who is in Perth in Australia. So it's actually tomorrow for, for Rail. How are you doing, Rail? Perfectly great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, welcome, you know, welcome to your future. Yeah, I know. I have stopped. I've stopped asking every Australian guest for the lottery numbers because it's just becoming a bit of a lame joke. Yeah, there you go. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. And and what we're going to talk about today is excellence and showing up uh, as your best version of yourself. And Rail is known as Mr. Excellent. Thirty years as a serial entrepreneur, and now you help you you know you help and educate people. And the thing today is. So we hear a lot about turning up as your best self and your best version of you and all of that. But let's face it, Rail, I'm not sure if people really understand what that actually means. I mean, it's a nice thing to say, but what does it actually mean? Well, it means that you're showing up. At, and I'll use a quick analogy. I was doing a spin class live on one of the platforms the other day. I have a spin bike at home. And somebody in the class had as a hashtag or their username my strongest self and that really crystallized excellence to me um you know and that's something i talk about every day and and i messaged the person and we, we you know i managed to track them down and we got chatting and her view of the world was 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 that every day she'll show up for a class and see that hashtag my strongest self mm -hmm. and it meant being her strongest version of herself that day in other words had a bender of a night, went out and drank, you know, three dozen beers, got up and did the class as the strongest version of themselves that day. And I think that's what excellence is. So it's about it's about not comparing yourself to anybody else, not comparing yourself to the person next to you. Mm -hmm. It's comparing yourself to yourself. And that's where most people struggle is they compare themselves. Geez, look at that person. They ran the marathon and, you know, two hours and two minutes why can't i do that well it, it's not you it is you know mm -hmm. if your personal best so when i do these spin classes and that that's the, the epitome of the excellence is i i compete against my personal best and not against anyone else in the class and so that you know i have i have i recently published a blog about this um, called my strongest self and my excellent self, and it was exactly that. It was it was five points that I made about how you show up on a personal level as being excellent. Right. Um, no, and I, and I totally agree. And that's what I that's what I often talk about is I do martial arts, and it's the same thing. Is you you compete against yourself, you compare yourself to yourself all the time because there's always going to be somebody faster stronger bigger whatever then then you are more nimble um and uh and I, I totally agree it's like it's it's you're not the person on your right or left it's yourself and and as you said showing up that day the best version of yourself uh and but that takes that takes a conscious decision correct it does and i mean in the blog i spoke about what i called an excellence field okay and so what is an excellence field? And, and it's, you know, using the five letters of field. And, and there were five points that I made. Now, there are there are 20 others that I use in my work and consulting and and, and with companies and with individuals. And, and so I used to be called the business excellence guy. And now I changed mm -hmm. it to just excellence because ultimately for businesses to be excellent, their people need to be excellent. And so, you know, I really work with people, not with companies. But ultimately, it's in the company that they become excellent. Mm -hmm. But I looked at things, to, you know, in, in simple terms. How do you show up as excellent every day? Well, one of the first things is to um, take your hardest tasks and do them first. And, and then right. your day falls into place after that. You know, develop a skill to be able to work intensely. So I'm, you know, my wife says I'm undiagnosed ADHD. Um, and, and now I have the tension span of a goldfish, you know, you ever watched a goldfish in a bowl, it swims mm -hmm. around, and, oh, that's a rock. Oh, that's a rock that, you know, uh, but that I, over the years, I've developed the skill of being able to actually sit down and focus for, you know, 90 minutes, 60 minutes at a time and get amazing 
and volumes of work done in that time by just focusing, by having that intensity to what I do. Yeah, so I mean that that's that's a really interesting you know concept there. I I, I believe apparently we're we have less of an attention span than goldfish nowadays. That's the latest uh, latest fake research that's out. Um, but but to your point about about people, uh, you know, in companies, people turning up as as the best version of themselves, that requires a level of obviously personal accountability, of personal pride, of 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 personal action, if you like. Oh, yeah. So in a company, you know, so, so I do a lot of work in the culture space. I, m- most of the spaces mm-hmm. I work in are culture, leadership and strategy. And, and in the culture space, when a company has an amazing purpose and, and, and in a broad sense of purpose is something that's bigger than the company itself. So, so you know, everyone shows up. And, and the classic example of that goes back to 1962 when John Kennedy um, visited um, Na- NASA, um, and it was five or six years before the, the moon landing. And he saw a man very vigorously sweeping in the corner. And he said to him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm doing my part to get a man on the moon. Mm. And, you know, and, and so that level of understanding of the greater purpose of the organization helps people understand why they're there. Now, we, we in, in 2022, and and probably started this this movement about 2015, 16, we started seeing this mass disengagement of team members around the world. And, and along with that was a the, the, the generation I call toxic culture, where we and, and now in, in 2022, they've actually started called it called it quiet quitting. And when you combine all these trends together, the companies that are you know, employers of choice. Um, and why are they employers of choice? Because they have this thing called a purpose that is greater than the individuals themselves, and they see themselves a part, as a part of it. And then combined with that, they have a simple set of values that drives the way people in the company interact with each other. And so that business that has a great purpose and a great set of values is excellent in its own way, and that purpose and the value serves to help the team members feel part of that excellence. Mm-hmm. One of the things though we do see a lot, I mean, and I've come across and do see a lot today is, no, I, I agree with you on the companies that execute that, but there's a lot of, there's a big trend out there now where people love to put up their purpose, they put up their values, but it's not reflected in anything they do, right? So it's not actually, it's not actually real. Um, when it when it comes to the crunch, so and that's almost worse, if you like, um, than not having it at all. So I, I think people are a little bit more uh, discerning, as you would say nowadays, and they're not going to get pulled in by people who are you know claiming to have a purpose when they don't really uh, you know don't really have a, a belief in that purpose. Oh yeah, absolutely, and that so that's what makes you know for. Uh, I've been on a board for 20 years for, for a private school here in Perth. And we had a meeting with a school principal from uh, one of the eastern so eastern states. So uh, I can't remember if it was Sydney or Melbourne. But he came and he was telling us about the culture transformation in his team. And we said, that's fantastic. And 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 what did you do? And he, he told us about the set of values that they had developed for the team and, and the whole school. And we said, that's great. Tell us about your values. And he went to his wallet to take out his little handy plastic card that Mm -hmm. had the five values on. And I looked at this, and then this would have been 10 or 12 years ago. It was even before I started on my journey, which was 10 years ago, to really speak about culture and, and business excellence and growth and those things. And I watched this, and I went, if the CEO, the principal of the school being the CEO, hasn't embodied that set of values that they can, A, quote them off the top of their head and B, explain them with a passion, then how is the rest of the team going to buy in to that value set? And so you're right, it is something that has to be lived. Um, You know, we often get, you know, CEOs on, on social media now saying, oh, well, you know, the fact that I went out to a nightclub and, and I sniffed a bit of cocaine, it's got nothing to do with my, you know, my corporate persona. 
It has everything to do with it. Um, you know, but 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 that is that is the disconnect that we live mm -hmm. in in the current world where 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 people in a position of power, you know, don't actually see the implications of it. Yeah, there's, there, and there's another interesting part of that too, Rail, is that we hear an awful lot today about authenticity, right, and uh, being being authentic. But your point there, right? If I have a, if I have an outside persona and then I have an in in work persona, and I and I think that I can keep the two of them separate and that they're not related to each other, whatever, then how on earth can I be authentic? Well, you can't. I mean, there was a, there there, there was a. A, a famous joke years ago that said, you know, authenticity is everything. When you can fake that, you've got it made. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I always, you know, appreciated the humor of that. But but I don't think you can. I think probably 20, you know, pre-social media, you mm -hmm. could probably have this, this, this split personality where, you know, you went to work as one thing and really what you did in, you know, social life in your home, was kind of kept separate. But I think today in the era, you know, so use it as a simple example. 20 years ago, uh, employees were comfortable having a once a year or once every six months <laughs> um, uh, performance assessment, mm -hmm. right? You know, the, the, whereas in today's, I call it Siri time and Google time, you know, when we live in Siri time and Google time today, you know, the average employee, I mean, we've gone from, the six monthly assessment to to agile methodologies, which have a scrum of ten minutes every morning to assess people's work from the previous day. Mm -hmm. you no, know, and I and I think and I think that's an I think that's an that's a very very important point because I just wanted to underline it there uh, because it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine. They hold annual review thing anyway uh i think it's outdated and silly and, and if you look at most companies the review tends to be hey rail here's two things you did really well last year and here's 52 things that you need to improve upon and and to getting back to your point of culture and values is we don't spend enough time uh focusing on people's strengths and helping them as you said almost on a daily basis to to really maximize their strengths and the things that they're good at instead of us always focusing on things that we think need improving well, yeah, so I've spent, you know, the best part of COVID, um, you know, not being, a, you know, a speaker traveling the world. I mm -hmm. traveled from the studio for most of the time. But um, w with the lack of time spent on airplanes, I had more time to put some things into action. And one of the things that, that has frustrated me was that companies measured everything on financial numbers only because it was the only real thing we could get our head around was numbers. And then, you know, you have some famous worldwide surveys of employee engagement and this sort of stuff, but nobody actually put their, put something on the line that said, here is a number based on culture, on leadership and strategy. And so over the last few years, I've developed something and I, and I call it the, the, the business excellence indicator. And it actually allows companies to put a number onto excellence. And what is excellence? It's the intersection of, of culture, leadership, and strategy. And when all three of those are working together, you get a return on excellence. And so I've gone beyond that, you know, the performance review, where I'm looking at performance of teams within an organization and with the, and, and overall in the organization, but measuring, as Jack Welch from GE said, the hard the, the, the soft stuff is the hard stuff. And so mm -hmm. put measures into place that allow companies to measure the soft stuff and get their measures that are leading indicators of performance as opposed to lagging, which is all the financial data. Yeah, And I think the other part, too, is making sure that people are connected to, you know, the purpose of the company or the goals of the company or the targets of the company. Because I think that's a lot of times where people feel... You know, disconnected or, or ambivalent towards the organization is when they can't connect what they do directly to what the companies, they can't see the impact that they're particularly making. And I think companies fall down a lot of the times in making sure that everybody understands the strategy, understands the purpose, and then understands how they contribute to it. Well, that's interesting. So when I was a, a young engineer um, 30 odd years ago, 
working on a gold mine of 55,000 staff over 10 shafts. Um, my drove my bosses mad because <laughs> I was this young graduate engineer who, you know, but I wanted to know how my specific role fitted in to the great organization. You know, how did my contribution as a junior engineer or a shaft engineer, as I was uh, at the time, a junior a junior shaft engineer, how did my role, what did I do on a daily basis that contributed to getting the gold to the market and selling it? Now, mm -hmm. most of the engineers that I worked with were only concerned about their own job and delivering on their own job and getting their four weeks of annual leave. And I knew that I was different because I wanted to know what impact I was making on the whole process and drove my, my bosses mad trying to find that out. <laughs> and it, it is, and it's a, it's a kind of an interesting, it's an interesting concept that um, one thing that I, I, I was fortunate to be able to put into operation in a company I was running for a parent company a number of years ago was um, our, our, our target from the company was always, I mean, revenue growth, obviously, but it was operating profit. And so what I ended up doing was the sales, it's an easy side, you know, to measure the sales and to, and they get rewarded. So I put everybody else who's on the delivery side and the operational side bonus on efficiency and anything over, you know, the operating profit numbers, you know, they get paid bonuses. So not only did they start to become very focused on efficiency, on saving money, on making sure they were being like frugal and treating the company money as their own, but they also started putting pressure on the salespeople to be better with how they constructed their deals from a gross uh, margin point of view. And, and it turned out to be a fantastic uh, relationship. Well, you, you talk about money and money is an interesting one. There's been a lot of research over the last few years about people putting a number on culture, but a number being a dollar number. And, mm -hmm. and, and what that meant was that they are choosing an employer, so a place to work. And, and, and I've started seeing, particularly out of Southeast Asia, interestingly, a lot of companies um, have been, uh, you know, looking at their cultural strategy plan and their strategy plan includes being an employer of choice. But, there, you know, when you talk to employees, particularly in Australia at the moment, where there's a shortage of staff mm -hmm. and, you know, there are two jobs for every person, people are not actually making financial decisions. You know, am I going to take the $150,000 job or the $140,000 job? They're actually saying, I'm happy to take the $140,000 job because it's got a much better culture in that organization. Um, from my public research of that organization. And therefore, I'm prepared to say that culture, that being part of that culture is worth $10,000 to me. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, could, I, could see, I could see how that happens. But, it, and it, but think about the organization, if they got their culture right and they paid better than everybody else, they'd have a monopoly. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. But, but, but you know, in, 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 in the large corporate sense, sure. those that really get the culture right. And I'm not saying they're going to then deliberately pay less, mm -hmm. but yeah, of course. You know, people will make a decision to say, I want to be part. I mean, think about when Google started what we call the Google-esque office, you know, it, it's now become commonplace, but you know, the bean bags and the, and, mm -hmm. and, and the hockey tables and the, the really cool canteen, you know, did they pay more? Maybe. Were people choosing to work there to be part of that workplace culture? Absolutely. Uh, although I will say that that um, you know that that has waned because if you um, you know people are less attracted by that stuff now, particularly. I mean, obviously because you got virtual work, but in a lot of those places, those bean bags and those foosball tables and everything, you know, started to gather dust after a, a period of time okay. because you know there were because of the rest absolutely. of it. Yeah. No, absolutely. But I said when they started, you know, it no, was no, yeah. very unique. It was creating mm -hmm. a different culture and absolutely. But, you know, so, so part of the work that we do in, in, in sales and you're going back to, to you know, I guess the, the, your, your own business and sales properties, we use a lot of stuff based around behavioral styles. Mm -hmm. and, and we started out, we was talking a while ago about being able to 
have two personas. Well, part of the the the, the work I do is around disc, and, and everyone goes, oh, not that sure. thing again. But disc has been around since 1929 and is incredibly accurate. But in a disc profile, particularly the one we use, we get two behavioral styles coming out. One is called your adapted style, and that's how you behave at work. Mm -hmm. And then your other is your natural style, which is how you behave outside of work and, more importantly, under stress. And when you compare those two styles, you start understanding that the, the, this employee has suppressed their, let's call it their dominance. It's the easiest one, actually, yeah. for most people to suppress. But as soon as they get under stress, they become this really dominant, overbearing personality. And that sometimes, you know, annoys the rest of the team and works counterculturally, et cetera. So, so it's very interesting when you start looking at that, that, that everybody, when, when I help employers use profiling tools to help them in their uh, recruitment of staff, we look for anomalies in those two profiles because mm -hmm. we want people to exhibit the same behavior in both places. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting concept as well because, uh, you know, that also then, once you discover that, it also requires a level of self-awareness on behalf of the individual. And I think self-awareness is, is, to be honest, I think is one of the greatest keys to success. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, it is being aware about yourself and it's about, it's about who you are. And I always talk about, you know, on the journey to excellence, but everyone assumes that the journey to excellence means that today you are better than yesterday. But Sometimes on a journey, we take paths mm -hmm. and we have to detour and go back and come back in a different direction. And so it is a journey that's not necessarily a linear journey to excellence. Yeah. And so sometimes you do have this, you know, turn back before you go forwards again. And that's OK, too. And so we started out the conversation talking about what is excellence. Well, excellence is this idea of being the best version of yourself or your company every day. And, and what does that mean? It means sometimes today is actually not as good as yesterday, but mm -hmm. it is still that strong self, that, that best version of my excellent self today. Yeah, and and I think that's a really really important point for people people to take away the fact that your 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 path to excellence isn't a linear path. And yes, on a particular day you might be a lot worse than yesterday, but if you're aware of that and and you you know maybe tomorrow you'll be twice as good as you were the day before or whatever. But to your point is, and you know nothing in life is linear, and and I don't think we should expect a journey of this uh, importance to be linear either. No, absolutely. It's not, and it's uh, it's it's not linear, and it is, but it is about you know the self awareness. It is about um, you know my self awareness. A lot of it came from ten years ago when I was doing triathlons, decided to run a marathon, and then they discovered that I had two blocked arteries and ended up with two stents. That changed my self awareness of myself because mm -hmm. at that time I couldn't. You know, in my book, one of the, the opening lines in the book says, for many years, I have misunderstood the ideas behind confidence, overconfidence and arrogance. Mm. And as I've got into my 50s, I've actually learned the difference. And so, the, you know, that's what that self-awareness for me is about. It, it's just about being that that awareness of who you are, what you're doing. And, you know, I, I guess... One of the so I mentioned that you know this this excellence field. Well, the E of excellence is experts, and so it, it takes a certain level of maturity to take advice from experts, from mm -hmm. mentors. You know, yeah. I, I probably spent twenty years of my working life thinking that I was the only one who knew enough about my own business, and I had a business partner for all those time or for most of that time, and that's okay, the two of us. But we saw ourselves as an island. We mm. never went out to seek mentorship from other people. And, you know, looking back on 30 plus years, how much more efficient I would have been by seeking out experts. And those experts are not experts for life. They're experts for a particular right. period in your life. Yeah, I, and, and I think that's another great important point to a big believer in mentors as well. And as you said, I mean, 
uh, nothing has to be forever. I mean, people often get caught up in that whole thing of like, if I make a decision, it's like final. Well, no, it's not actually. Nothing is forever. You know, you can uh, yeah. alter things later. Listen, this has been fantastic, Grail, and all of Grail's information is going to be below this video, including links to the his book. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you. There you go. The book is up on screen. Tell people a little um, bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, so I, I work with companies. I do a lot of speaking. Um, until you know, 2019, I was really doing keynote speeches, um, mostly since uh, during COVID, lockdowns, etc. I shifted over to more long-term programs and daytime and day programs, so one to two day programs for companies in those three areas, strategy, leadership, and culture. Just because I think, and I work with them to get that right. Um, my background is I've listed companies on two different stock exchanges. I, For my sins, I have two master's degrees. Um, not that relevant because I graduated with the last one over 30 years ago, um, which is fun because my second master's was in, in software engineering. But in today's world, I wouldn't call myself a software engineer, just somebody who has a passion for technology. Um, and that's what I do. And I've and as I said, I, the, the biggest or most recent development is my um, my business excellence indicator, which is available for companies to use um, and other coaches and mentors to be able to measure leadership, culture, and strategy. And anyone can reach out to me on LinkedIn or through railbricker.com. And mm -hmm. I am sure you you have for the for the show notes um, yep. railbricker com slash free book and they can mm -hmm. download a free pdf i'd love them to go to amazon or one of the other booksellers and buy the book because that way i get about three cents per book but <laughs> um, um but i am happy to give people a free pdf version at railbricker.com slash free book yeah that's fantastic listen thanks very much rail and uh I believe Rail's off to do what's a, a five thousand mile bike ride now, is it? Or... Not quite. No, I'm hoping. <laughs> um, the, the wind was quite strong this morning, so um, they the, the prediction was it'll drop down to about fifteen knots about now. So I'm hoping to get out up to the beachfront for a you know fifty to sixty kilometer ride, nice swim in the in the Indian Ocean, and no, uh, shower no. and get to work in two and a half hours or three hours time. So. Fantastic. Um, I'm at work now and I'm going down to the beach, which is 10 minutes away. Yeah, well, listen, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us uh, all the way from Australia, Rail. Uh, thank you for watching and listening wherever you are. And I'll see you all again soon. Yeah.